This video is brought to you by Smarter MA. Get instant access to a free practice test and study guides at smartermma.com. First question, let's get into it. And it's a tricky one, a little bit of math. What amount would a patient owe if they have a coinsurance of 20% and the cost of their medical visit is $400? So first off, what's coinsurance mean? That's the amount that the insured, that's the patient, is responsible for paying compared to the amount that the insurance company will cover. So coinsurance of 20% means that the patient is responsible for 20% of the total which in this case is $400. And so in order to calculate the patient's portion of the payment, we're gonna multiply the total cost of the visit by the percentage that they're responsible for, which is 20%. So we can find 20% of $400 by taking $400 and multiplying by 0.2, because 0.2 is the decimal form version of 20%. So similarly, if we had 50%, what would that be in decimal point form? It would be 0.5. In this case, we have 20%, so we're gonna multiply by 0.2. So how do we do 400 times 0.2? Well, there's a couple of ways. The first is to say, what would 400 times 0.1 be? Well, we would just move the decimal place over one. So 400 times 0.1 would be equal to 40. Now, we weren't actually trying to multiply by 0.1. We were trying to multiply by 0.2. Therefore, we have to take our total from 0.1 and times it by two. It would be equal to $80. That, in my mind, is the simplest way of doing this calculation. And therefore, this patient would owe $80, which is the 20% coinsurance of 400. Next question. And these are tough ones. There's a lot of memorization. In an NKG, which electrode is placed at the fourth intercostal space on the left side of the sternum. So first, what does intercostal mean? Well, intercostal is that space in between two different ribs. So if this is a rib and this is a rib, the intercostal space exists in between them. And the sternum represents that central part of the rib cage right in here. So going back to our question, in an EKG, which is going to place a bunch of electrodes on the chest, which one is gonna be placed at the fourth intercostal space on the left side of the sternum? And to learn a little bit more about this question, we're going to go to smarterma.com and the second practice test. And if you wanna get a practice test, completely for free, just like this, head to smarterma.com right now if you're preparing for your medical assistant certification test. And this isn't just for the CCMA. We also have the AAMA, the AMT, and the NCCT, NCMA. But if we head to SmarterMA in this practice test number two and see this question, which is related to it, a medical assistant is placing a V5 lead on a patient for an EKG. Where should the assistant place the electrode? And this is a slightly different question than what we're looking at, but we're going to use this for the explanation. So at SmarterMA, we try to break things down really simply, and we have this list of where each electrode goes. So V1 is at the fourth intercostal space, the right sternal edge, V2, et cetera. And we also have this schematic that kind of outlines what is that we're referring to. Here's V1 electrode, V2 electrode, V3, V4, V5, and V6. And I'm not going to go into each of these right now. You need to take time. It's going to take some time to study this and to memorize it. But just to get an idea, here's what this would look like when it's actually being placed on the chest. And this is just referring to the chest electrodes. We also have the limb electrodes, which aren't shown here. And at SmarterMA, we always try and summarize at the end with a very clear takeaway. So here's where all of these different chest electrodes are being placed. Now, if we head back to our original question, which electrode is placed at the fourth intercostal space on the left side of the sternum? And we can see that V2 is placed at that fourth intercostal space at the left sternal edge right there. And therefore, V2 is the answer to our question. Here's the next question. A medical assistant has an order to administer an intramuscular pain medication to a patient. Which of the following actions should the assistant take prior to giving the injection? A, retrieve a lancet. B, anchor the vein. C, cleanse the site in a circular motion from the center outward. Or D, don a gown and face shield. And the answer is C, cleanse the site in a circular motion from the center outward. And so what's that mean? It means that say the deltoid, the shoulder is our injection site. You're gonna start from the center of the injection site and move your hand with the alcohol pad in a circular motion, starting from the center and gradually moving outward. And why are we gonna do that? This is going to widen the area of cleansing, making sure that we get far enough around the site of the injection. And by moving from the center outward, it prevents moving bacteria from outside the skin in. This way we're always cleansing and pushing the bacteria outwards and making sure that we're cleansing that area, which is gonna help to reduce the risk of infection when we actually give the injection. Isopropyl alcohol is the main cleansing agent used for this. And important to note, the alcohol swab needs to have at least 70% alcohol. That's a high yield point that comes up. And then finally, this also is a high yield point that comes up on tests. After cleansing the site, you need to let the alcohol dry completely before you do your injection to ensure that everything has been 
been disinfected properly. Now let's look at the incorrect answer choices. A, retrieve a lancet. Now this is incorrect. A lancet is used to puncture the skin, often the fingertip, to get a little bit of blood. It's often used for blood glucose testing. It's not used for intramuscular injections. So this is an example of a finger prick with a lancet, where a little bit of blood is going to be drawn up and then used for blood glucose testing. B, anchoring a vein. Now anchoring a vein is done during, for example, a blood draw or an intravenous injection. And you can see anchoring being done here, where the thumb is pressed below the site of the injection. So this helps to make the vein more prominent and prevents the vein from kind of rolling out of position when we're trying to slide that intravenous needle into it. And ooh, this question is asking what's wrong here. First of all, it looks like they're not going into the vein at all. And second, their fingertips are on the other side of where the injection is being done. Big no-no. C, cleanse the site of circular motion from the center outward. We know that's the correct answer. And then D, don a gown and face shield. No, a gown and face shield aren't necessary for administering an intramuscular injection. So this is PPE, personal protective equipment. And how much protective equipment do we need? It's what we reasonably think is required to keep us and the patient safe. A procedure like a cyst removal, where there could be potential blood splatter, would be a good example of when a gown and a face shield would be necessary. But for delivering an intramuscular injection, just a basic mask and sometimes gloves are all that are required at least by law, though medical assistants can request to wear additional PPE if they'd like. Hey, if you're enjoying this video, as a way of seeing things, can you do me a huge favor? Tell someone else about Smarter Money in our videos, whether it be your friends, your classmates, or posting about it in Facebook groups. I'm working really hard to create great content and would be so grateful if you would share it with others. Next question. Which of the following actions should a medical assistant take when disposing of a used needle in disposable syringe? A. Recap the needle before disposal. B. Remove the needle from the syringe. C drop the syringe needle first into the sharps container, or D, place the needle and syringe in a biohazard bag. This is a little bit longer of a question, so I'll give you a second to read it again. And the answer is drop the syringe needle first into a sharps container. So this demonstrates what that looks like. The reason why we do needle first is because you don't want the needle pointing up at you. So we're going to hold the needle pointing downwards over top of the sharps container and then drop it and let it go. And this way we're going to ensure safe disposal of the needle that keeps us safe as well as other people that might be in the vicinity. So why the incorrect answer is wrong. A, we never recap needles before disposal. This is something that maybe used to be done and it's no longer done. When a needle needle is used, it is not recapped. This is an example of recapping a needle and actually showing it in the worst way possible, which is two hands. Even this method down here though, recapping it off of the table is no longer recommended. What the recommendations are is to directly dispose of the needle by dropping it, as we said, needle first into a sharps container. We don't need to recap it after use, it should be disposed of right away. This helps to prevent accidental needle stick injuries. B, remove the needle from the syringe. So in theory, that would be unscrewing the needle tip from the syringe itself. We're not gonna do that again, we're just gonna dispose of it. And then finally, D, place the needle in syringe in a biohazard bag. No, a biohazard bag is a plastic bag that could be punctured by the needle. We always need to use a proper plastic sharps container, which again looks like this and is designed specifically for sharps and will be disposed of in a way that it is designed for sharps waste. Other things that might go in a sharps receptacle include scalpel blades. Okay, next question. Which of the following represents the dorsal recumbent position? A, the patient is lying on their stomach with their head turned to the side. B, the patient is lying on their back with their legs bent and feet flat on the exam table. C, the patient is lying on their back with their legs elevated and held in stirrups. Or D, the patient is lying on their left side with their right leg bent upward and their left arm behind their back. So there are a lot of words going on here, and I think it's important for us to take a step back if we're answering a question like this and thinking to ourselves, what is the dorsal recumbent position? Get that idea in our head first, and then we can go through the answer choice. And the answer is B, the patient is lying on their back with their legs bent and their feet flat on the exam table. And Patient positioning is a common question and a high yield question on these medical assistant certification tests. So you should know all of these positions. When I hear dorsal, I'm thinking of the back and recumbent is lying down. So dorsal recumbent position is to me, the patient lying on their back with their feet flat. So this is a good example of dorsal recumbent, which is also known as supine and the patient lying flat on their back. Now let's go through the other answer choices. The patient is lying on their stomach with their head turned to the side. This represents the prone position, which we can see here. 
where a patient lying flat on their stomach called prone with their head turned to the side. Over here, again, is another picture of supine, which is also known as dorsal recumbent, as we just discussed. C, the patient is lying on their back with their legs elevated and held in stirrups. This is actually that very common position for medical assistance certification tests called lithotomy. And in lithotomy, it's similar to dorsal recumbent in that the patient's on their back, but this time their feet are in stirrups and it is elevated. And this is often used for pelvic exams. So examinations of the genital area, um, particularly in women for vaginal exams. And then finally, D, the patient is lying on their left hand side with their right leg bent upward and their left arm behind their back. They're there's a lot of words going on here, and you might see the patient's lying on their left side and start to think that, oh, this sounds like the lateral recumbent, right? Lateral meaning side. However, we can see that this patient doesn't have their leg bent, the right leg bent, or their left arm behind their back. So what's the change here? This position actually describes SIMS, which is a common position used for rectal exams. So the patient's on their side, they have their one arm behind their back, their leg bent, and this can give the provider good access to the rectal area, for example, during a rectal exam, if they need to insert a digit into the rectum for evaluation of the prostate, this positions the patient for the most comfort. Therefore, D refers to the SIMS position. So let's go ahead and answer one more question, bonus question, just for the fun of it. But if you're looking for a comprehensive list of questions, again, head to smarterma.com, where we have individual question banks, five full practice tests. There are over 1,000 questions that will help you get prepared for your medical assistant certification test. A medical assistant is documenting an interaction in a patient chart which of the following documentation types is structured based on the entity that provided the data? A, problem-oriented. B, source-oriented. C, cheddar formatting. Or D, soap formatting. So they're asking us for the documentation type that's based on the entity that provided the data. The entity that provides the data is the source, and this represents a source-oriented medical record. So what are the differences between a problem-oriented medical record and a source-oriented medical record? At a high level, problem-oriented medical records organize charts based off of the problems around the patient's medical issues and concerns, or a source-oriented organizes information based on the source of that info. So here's an example of problem-oriented, where it's kind of going through the patient chief complaint, the patient history, the examination findings, test results, treatment plans, versus in source-oriented, it goes through who provided, who was the source of the information. And in this detailed explanation, we also go through cheddar formatting and SOAP formatting, subjective, objective, assessment, and plan. And you can find all of this at smartrma.com in our first practice test. That's it for this video. I hope you found it helpful. Check out smartrma.com for an absolutely free practice test, as well as more review videos. And if you have any questions, hit the chat icon on the website, and we're happy to help you out. And make sure you smash that like button and hit subscribe, as I'm going to be making more videos to help you pass your medical assistance for vacation test.